from John Hanks. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I seen you at the cathedral in oh, right. May you came and spoke to uh, parishioners at Block S Bay last year. I did, that's right. Yes, I did. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes, that's right. I know you want to come. Sometimes I put my diary to see where I've been. Do you remember that? Yes. I think. Do you live nearby? Oh, yeah. I live in Grafton. Oh, that's not true. Waiting for the speaker to come in and Five years, so we've got that. Okay, I see that. 
May I ask, is there anyone here from the um, Commission for Ecumenism? Excuse Is there anyone here from that group? I don't know. We're live on Zoom. Oh? Yes, apparently. Okay. Yeah, let's just let's see that there. 
just arrived, so that's good, <laughs> until we're down. Is the temperature okay? Yeah. Is it cool enough? Or? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
respond to it. Sure. 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 So, okay. Yeah, you're all ready to go. Yeah. yeah. So, just open. So, what I'll do is I'll introduce you first. Uh, yeah, it's that one. Okay, we've got two of these. So, I will introduce you first. Okay. And then I'll pass this on to you. And you choose the, way, okay, okay. the microphone, right? Okay, good. Perfect. Let me just practice how this is done. Right, I think we will start. It's seven. Hopefully, we have people waiting online. Okay, uh, first of all, welcome and thank you for coming along to our talk tonight. And it is organized by uh, the Catholic Diocese of Auckland, our uh, Commission for Ecumenism and Interfaith. My name is Louisa Rani and I will be your host tonight. And I am really excited about our guest speaker and especially her presentation as well. Um, but before we go on, we have some housekeeping uh, matters to, to, you know, to share with you. Uh, in the case of fire emergencies, we will assemble at the car park where you came in, right? And the toilet and bathroom facilities is a third drawer on your left. Um, this session is streamed online, so I'm hoping that we have uh, participants that is watching us online, listening to this talk. So the order for tonight will be after her presentation, there will be Q&A time. Okay, and the last one is also very important. We are in level one. All right, we are asked to uh, follow the uh, procedures, which is um, you signed it, and uh, you, you have the QR codes uh, on our walls there, and uh, it will be appreciated if you can use that, please. Okay. Um, tonight's lecture is part of our 2021 talk series, organized to promote Christian unity. And to our online participants, you will be able to hear and see our presenter and throughout the talk, when you think of a question, simply type it on your computer using the chat option that is available and we will collect your questions and pass it on to our presenter for her to respond to. Now about our guest speaker. She is well known in the Catholic Diocese of Auckland and to the people of New Zealand. Dr. Rocio Figueroa Alvia, who is our guest speaker for tonight, is widely known by the staff and students of New Zealand's National Catholic Tertiary Provider called Te Kupinga Catholic Theological College. And those students include the seminarians training for priesthood. As a Catholic theologian from Peru, Dr. Rocio is a lecturer in systematic theology at the college. She is an external researcher at the Centre for Theology and Public Issues at Otago University in New Zealand. She has a bachelor's degree and license in theology from the Pontifical Faculty of Theology in Lima and obtained her doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Rocio has previously lectured and worked in Peru Italy and Mexico. She worked in the Holy See as head of the women's section in the Pontifical Council for the Laity. Figueroa's present research focus is on the theological and pastoral responses for survivors of church sexual abuse. So we can rest assured tonight that Dr. Rocio Figueroa will share with us an amazing topic on an ecumenical spectrum. So with much anticipation, I now hand you over to our guest speaker, Dr. Rocio Figueroa, for her presentation to us on the topic, Ecumenism, one possible answer for a contemporary New Zealand. Over to you, Rocio. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to put it. Here. Can you help? Okay. Is it all right? Can yeah. you? Yeah. Okay. I will be. <clears throat> well, thank you, Luisa, for the invitation and for having this moment and sharing with you some some thoughts that I think all of us we know, but sometimes we have to remember and 
and keep the memory on. Um, I try to connect uh, ecumenism and the situation of the contemporary New Zealand today. First of all, when we talk about ecumenism, um, it's interesting what, because we are celebrating Utunum Sindh, what uh, John Paul II talked about it, and he said it's not an appendix of Catholic life, but a serious and important commitment. And I think this is important because sometimes I feel that um, we Catholics, we feel, think that ecumenism is not necessarily a part of our Christian life, like it's an appendix, like an accident, like, you know, theologians take care of ecumenism, and personally, I live my Christian life. While I think these words shows us, show us that the important, because the Pope says it's an organic part of the life and work of the church, organic. So to live ecumenism is really to live our vocation of being Christians, of being Catholics. It's to live our mission also. So, but of course we have to ask, okay, if now I understand the Pope is saying, our, the teaching of the church says, okay, it's, it's an organic part, it's something constitutive, so what is ecumenism? Uh, the, um, there is the document of a common understanding of our vision from the World Council of Churches, which try to define what is ecumenism. And they affirm, is the search for visible unity, not as an end itself, but in order to give credible witness so that the world may believe. The churches agreed that the term ecumenical embraces the quest for Christian unity, common witness in the worldwide task of mission and evangelism, and commitment to diaconia, service, and the promotion of justice and peace. I think it's a very broad definition of what is ecumenism. But at the same time, we have to ask first, what is this visible unity that we are looking for? So, it's interesting because what we think of ecumenism at the end is what we think about the church. So, our vision of ecumenism ha has a strong link with our vision of our own ecclesiology, of our own vision of the church. And do you know that it is important to see that, of course, there has been a development in our understanding of ecumenism, in particular within the Catholic Church, but really also uh, all over the, the, the different churches. And it has been a development also in ecclesiology because, and that's why I think is what type of unity we are searching for? This is the first question. What type of unity? Some theologians have used geometrical sim geometric symbols to describe the mystery of the church and to describe also how to live ecumenism. So if we see, for example, at what the situation before Vatican II, before the Council, we can see that the vision of our church was like a pyramid church. The pyramid church was a very, a very strong hierarchical vision of the church in which we consider the church as an institution. So it was a very, of course, it was after the Reformation, so it was a very apologetic uh, response to the situation of the division of the churches. And the Catholic Church tried to affirm its own identity, in one way protecting its own identity, and said, okay, it's the institution, and the institution is a very organized, and it was very well defined, an organized institution in which you have the Pope at the top, then cardinals, bishops, priests, deacons, laity. So, in this, and what was the relationship with other churches. It was very interesting because more or less the principle was extra ecclesiam nulla salus. So outside the church, 
there is no salvation. And that's a vision of my grandmother. I remember my grandmother. So the vision was extra, ecclesia, so outside the church. There is no salvation. And if we remember the dogmas of Trent and, and the councils, it was, if you don't believe that the Catholic Church is the unique, the, the truth, the only one, anathema sia. No? You are anathema. So it was a very institutional vision of the church, very restricted, and outside, you have no salvation. So I remember my grandma was very worried because one of the uh, sons was not so believer and left the church and she, and she said he would go to hell. You know, so the one who was outside the church had no salvation. Actually, they, they were um, threatened by condemnation. So it was a very, and that is why, for example, that vision of the, of the children who, who were born or who, who died without baptism. So that's why many uh, theologians created this idea of the limbo in which the, the children who had no baptism, they went to a, they didn't go to hell because it was what, what, in, what an innocent little child will do in hell if he didn't do anything and he didn't sin. So we created this imagine, imaginary idea of a limbo in which the children who was, were not baptized went to this limbo. So it was a very restrictive idea uh, pre-Second Vatican Council. Um, it's interesting what happened with Vatican Second Council. Of course, John uh, 23rd had an incredible vision. He wanted to seek the unity of, 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 of Christians. And he said, many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible structure. These gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling towards Catholic unity. The vision, and, and, and we created a, an image. I remember this was my stage, my, my education when I was a student of theology. And I remember I was taught, I was, I was, I was born in 1968. Now you will guess my age. Okay, <laughs> we'll do the sums. And, and in 68, and of course, I was a, a daughter of Vatican II. I, I was born with Vatican II. So the, the thing that I learned, the, the geometric form, symbol that I learned about the church was the, the concentric circles. So the way we understood the church, or we were, were, how we were taught about the relationship between the Catholic church and the other churches was with these circles. So in the circles, it's fascinating because we understood, okay, here in the center we have Christ. And of course, we affirm that we are the one truly church. And we are here the Catholics. And the one who are nearest us are the Orthodox. And then we have the ref we Protestants. And then we have the Jews. And then we have the Muslims. And finally, we have the non believers. So that was the scheme where how I was taught theology in what we said, okay, all of us, all the different churches are oriented towards Christ. But in one way, we define that we were the, the ones nearer Christ, not the ones who are the, you know, the ones who are in one way have the plenitude of the truth. So that was the way which we approach a little bit to ecumenism, but we said, okay, and that's, that was an important step of Vatican II. We say, okay, they, these, the Orthodox, the Protestants, our, they are our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters 
they are really our brothers and sisters, and those churches are, are our brothers and sisters. So it was a really a, a big step in which um, we locate the Catholic Church a little bit at the core. And I think, of course, after Vatican II, there was a lot of pos positive attitude towards ecumenism, a lot of hope, thinking that finally we will get the unity. Uh, lots of initiatives began, the dialogues between Lutherans and, and, and Catholics, uh, Catholics and, and Reformed churches, so the Orthodox and Catholics. But, for example, the other day I was listening to a, a video of an Orthodox theologian and he said he affirmed, well, now we are in the winter of ecumenism. So he was a little bit pessimistic about this, the actual situation of ecumenism. Um, I'm, I'm actually not, not so negative, I have to say. Uh, perhaps living in New Zealand has changed my mind about ecumenism. You have to realize that I live in a country in which 98% were Catholics. Now we, have, we are 87% of Catholics, so you can imagine that I was just surrounded by Catholics and I didn't have more or less any contact with other um, churches, Christian churches or other religions. Living in New Zealand changed my perspective of ecumenism incredibly and I will, I will also share with you the changes that have, have come through. So, but this has been a little bit the, the vision of Second Vatican Council in, in which it has been important because it has begun this dialogue with a lots of fruits. But now I would like to present the theory of Pope Francis about ecumenism. So he offers a new model, a new symbol, geometric symbol. His model of unity, he says, is not that of a sphere, where every point is equidistant from the center, and there are no differences between them. Instead, it is the polyhedron three-dimensional body with many angles and surfaces, which reflects the convergence of all its parts, each of which preserves its distinctiveness and seeks to gather in that polyhedron the best of each. I really think it's fascinating, this image, and I really think it helps the vision, it, it changes the vision, because before, perhaps we understood unity as, well, before Vatican II, all converting and coming to the unity to the Catholic Church. Then afterwards it was, okay, we begin a dialogue, we are brothers and sisters, and okay, each of us remain as believers in Christ, but the unity is always orientated towards Christ. But now, I think this is much more flexible and it's a vision that brings a little bit of hope of how can we understand unity? Because unity is not uniformity, but unity is that we can have different visions, different traditions, different approaches, but there is something that is the essence that is that beautiful diamond that is what we have in common that is that we believe in jesus christ as the savior and i think that's that's the most important thing you know our baptism that unites us all the christians in 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 who is the way the truth and the life Jews into this. If, yeah. you, if your criterion is believing in Christ, then they kind of lift Yes, I will go there. I will go there. But we, okay, because this is, okay, a talk of ecumenism. I have not done a talk of the relation with other religions, but I think it's the same in one way. Why? Because the common, the common thing that all of us, all humanity we have, is the dignity as human beings as being created by, by God. And it doesn't matter that a non-believer doesn't believe in God, because for me, he is image of God. So we share the same humanity, 
and the same dignity and you know the same transcendence and that is why it unites me with that person it unites me with all humanity because what is catholic church universal we want to embrace all humanity and that's what god wanted god wanted salvation for all humanity so i think that is what unites us so uh, this image according to the theologian walter casper walter casper you knew that he was the president of of the um, the pontifical council for for the relationship with other churches and and, and religions and and he said that this this image enables a mutual ecumenical process of learning and a complementarity a complementary relationship that is mutual enriching that is harmony as created by the spirit of god so i think really uh, pope francis had here a breakthrough about how in the future or how we can now live ecumenism and also the relationship with other and we will see that with other religions i would just would like to really it's a long story that is not as big as i wanted the <laughs> but it's a, such an important uh, paragraph because for me evangelic gaudium is the the letter the programmatic letter of pope francis really in that letter he more or less showed us his proposal for the future of the church and he says try to be a church who goes forth and go to the peripheries try to be a church a poor church for the poor try to be a church that is an ecumenical church and here i think he sees and he has this definition of what for he is ecumenism and he says given the seriousness of the counter witness of division among christians particularly in asia and africa the search for paths to unity becomes all the more urgent missionaries on those continents often mention the criticism complaints and ridicule to which the scandal of divided christians gives rise if we concentrate on the convictions we share and if we keep in mind the principle of the hierarchy of truths, we will be able to progress decidedly towards common expressions of proclamation, service, and witness. The immense number of people who have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot leave us indifferent. Consequently, commitment to a unity which helps them to accept Jesus Christ can no longer be a matter of mere diplomacy or forced compliance, but rather an indispensable path to evangelization. Signs of divisions between Christians in countries ravaged by violence add further causes of conflict on the part of those who should instead be a leaven of peace. How many important things unite us? If we really believe in the abundantly free working of the Holy Spirit, we can learn so much from one another. It is not just about being informed about others, but rather about reaping what the Spirit, the Spirit has sown in them, which is also meant to be a gift for us. To give but one example in the dialogue with our Orthodox brothers and sisters, we Catholics have the opportunity to learn more about the meaning of Episcopal collegiality and their experience of synodality. Through an exchange of gifts, the Spirit can lead, lead us even more fully into truth and goodness. I will now try to um, go in depth about this incredible paragraph of what he thinks about what is ecumenism because i think it gives us an answer about the challenges for new zealand the first part of the paragraph says the immense number of people who have not received the gospel of jesus christ cannot leave us indifferent consequently commitment to a unity which helps them to accept jesus christ 
can no longer be a matter of mere diplomacy, but rather an indispensable path to evangelization. What, what is our worry? What is our, our goal as Christians? We want to share the good news. And that is why I put the title, A Possible Respond to the Situation of, of New Zealand Today. Because New Zealand is a very secularist society. And we live also, in, a, in, in particular in our world, it's a very secularized society. And I think ecumenism can be an answer. Why? Because in the past, mo the majority of the population believed in God. Christianity was practiced by the majority in the Western societies, but not now. So today, religion and faith are not the point of reference for the moral or integral life of a New Zealander. In 2018, the census said 48.6 of New Zealanders stated that they had no religion. But Christianity remains the most common religion. 37% of the population identified as Christians. So then we have the other statistics, Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Presbyterians, other affiliations, the Maori religions, beliefs, philosophies, 43,000 821 people identified with Ratana. Uh, so these are the statistics of, in, of 2018. This has been the, the ones that I have found. I have not find, found the latest ones. But um, what it shows us, it shows us that what, what is the mission of the church, of, of every church, of all the churches? We have to share the good news. And the good news is to give humanity a flourishing life. What our message is not just about that, is it is about the revelation of God, but is the message of God for humanity. That is how can we are able to live um, the fulfillment of what does it mean to be human. So we have lots of people the percentage is so high. We have like 48% of the population of New Zealanders. So we are five, almost 5 million, 4 million and a half. So we have like 2 million, okay, that they do not believe in God. So we have 2 million people around us in our schools, works, um, families who have no faith and which their lives have no transcendental vision. So our mission, and, and it is interesting because as, as the, the philosopher Charles Taylor said in his book, The Secular Age, well, in the past, no one believed that you can be happy just in an immanent position. We have now a situation in which people can have no reference to God and feel that they are satisfied and that they are happy and that they don't need religion. I remember working at a rest home, for me it was a shock, cultural shock, because coming from a country in which the majority are religious, I remember working the first year here in New Zealand, working at a rest home, and an old guy told me, no, I will die, everything finishes there, and I don't need God, and I am okay, and I am fine, and he really felt and I was so surprised about it. You know, he felt that he was all right, that he had a good life, that he loved the people around him, that he worked hard, and that he would die and everything would finish there. So for me, it was like a cultural shock to see how it's possible not, ha not having the, the, the perception of uh, another life after this life, of a spiritual dimension. And Charles Taylor said, it is not because of technology. Modernity is not because of modernity. It's not because of the science. He says, what it has happened in, in our world is the lack of sensitivity towards the spiritual and dimension towards God. So it's the lack, he says, of imagination. Because of course, for being a, a believer, or for believing in God, 
You need to imagine. You need to use symbols. You when we believe in Christ, we need to think of ourselves being better persons. That's lots of imagination to <laughs> believing in ourselves being holy. So we have to imagine and we have to transform. But all the, all our beliefs need these symbols, this reality that open us to something else, to something beyond us. But of course, in a materialistic, consumeristic society, and in contact with no contact with nature, with no contact with yourself, you are not able to touch the innermost part of yourself who is thirsty of God, who is thirsty of something else, who, is, who gives meaning, sense, and, and, and density to your life. So really, our work as Christians, and that's why I think it's a response, ecumenism I think is really an answer for our times, I think ecumenism can respond awakening, awakening that desire for God. Because people are numbed. And of course, when the crisis comes, when you lose, lose a person, when you, you lose your job, when that pandemic comes to us, then you feel that that happiness that you had has no sense. And lots of depression and people who, have, who feel terribly sad and depressed and with no sense, and we come here, all Christians together. And that is why I think it is so important. First, as a personal level, I have to say for me, living in a, in a Catholic church, when I came, came here, and it was strange for me that when I, I remember myself, uh, the first year I put my nativity set in, in Lima, in Christmas, you have all the city with nativity sets. Wherever you turn, there is a nativity set. So when I went here to visit that street full of lights, there was no, not just one activity set. I was so sad. There were just angels. But I was so sad. But I remember a kid of five years old came to my house and he was a friend of us. And, and the little kid saw my nativity set and he said, he asked, who are those? So, and he was eight years old. So he had no idea that was, well, I had to explain. So I said, oh my goodness, how I explain my nativity set to someone that has no idea. Of, of the faith, of Christian faith. So for me, it was interesting because what happens to me now, I have to say, I didn't live in communism before. It was just theoretical, but it was not a lived reality. And I have to say that New Zealand has helped me because here, first, when I find, I remember, when I find a taxi driver who, asks, who tells me, yes, I, ah, you, you are a theologian. I am an evangelical and I, well, I feel so happy to share with someone who believes in Jesus and we have the same faith. So it's so, it's fascinating to me that I have never felt that connection before with, with other communities. And now, living in a secular society as New Zealand, I feel incredibly connected. And I think that is why Ecumenism can help us, first, to strengthen our faith in a very difficult situation in which, you have, in which our identity is really, we are losing our identity because we are immersed in this globalized, secularist society. So first, I think it strengthens our identity. But second, gives us that beautiful mission together to share with, with all this society that does not believe in God, it, that they can have this hope, that we can share this joy. So really, I have to say, I don't care who does the job. So if I see an a, a Orthodox, Evangelical, whoever, proclaiming the, the, the message of Jesus, I am so happy, you know? And I am really, I really, I am joyful. And I think that's ecumenism. Because the most imp important thing is what, it un what unites us, not what divides us. So, um, um, I have seen, I have said that. So that's why I think it's a source, ecumenism is a source of brotherhood and sisterhood and a way of strengthening our Christ Christian identity. But all 
also create an alternative message for all those who have the necessity of awakening a spiritual need. And I will talk about that, but also communism, I think, is an incredible, incredible tool for our mission. Our mission, as Francis said, is to be a poor church for the poor, but not just in an existential way, but to give voice, he said in Evangelii Evangelii Gaudium, to give voice to those who have no voice. Yes, you have heard that I work with victims of sexual abuse within the Catholic Church, but I work, my work of researcher, I work with an Anglican priest, and I, am, I have given last year a workshop with, to Anglican priests and Anglican ministers because we are giving voice to the victims, and that's our mission as Christians. Our mission is to try to build little by little the kingdom of God here in earth. And the job and the mission is immense. And it's so beautiful when we united our, our forces. And now we are publishing a book that will come now in March about, about also uh, victims of sexual abuse. And the ones who have participated in the book, the ones who have written are Catholics, Anglicans, Protestants, Evangelicals from South Africa, we have from all the churches, and all of us, we have united for one cause, that is be the voice of the ones who have no voice. And that is what Jesus asked of us. So we are doing ecumenism. So I am a believer that it's not a winter of ecumenism. I don't believe that. I really think that it's a springtime. I feel like that because I have never seen so such initiatives from different churches working together. And it's fascinating. So another element, so one, I think for the challenge of New Zealand is the topic of, um, I have to see the hour, so I don't, the topic of, of uh, secularism, but another is the variety of cultures. I think also, also the Pope says, signs of division between Christians in countries ravaged by violence add further causes of conflict on the part of those who should instead be a leaven of peace. So we know that in many countries, the differences between Christians and religions have created, and between uh, races, have been a source for violence and division. And here in New Zealand, no, we, we just think about that horrible event of the terrorist attack in, in the mosque. And it, I think it, made, it, it was very interesting when we Catholics, in, we, I live in front of Vermont Street, in front of the mosque. So um, the Iman invited all of us, invited the seminary and all of us to go to a service to the mosque. And I have to say, it's the first time in my life that I enter a mosque. And I was, you know, it was like a new world for me. And I said, I have lived in front and I never knew, you know? And it is so interesting because it made me, it questioned my attitude towards people who have different faiths. And it questioned my attitude because also they came to the Catholic Church and they came to a service of the liturgy in our parish. And it was absolutely beautiful. And I realize that sometimes here in New Zealand, we have all those different cultures. We have Muslims, Jews, Protestants, all type of churches. I have never seen so much churches like in New Zealand in my life, all, all type of churches and denominations. But actually, what I think is interesting is that the variety, the multiculturalism comes together with ecumenism because Ecumenism helps to respect being enriched by the different people, by the different faiths, and also and helps multiculturalism. So while other societies fight because of their differences, because I think we human beings, we are strange people. 
we really don't like differences. We are weird. We are weird. And I don't know why we don't accept the weirdness of the others. All of us, we are weird by thinking, oh, he's different. No, I am different. <laughs> so all of us, but we always think that the others are different. But I really think that each human being is a mystery. And we are so different, but we feel threatened. We like to be with the people that are like us. And I think the world is changing. Now we have this multicultural society, and I think it's beautiful. I think we have to use and embrace what is happening in New Zealand. It's fascinating. You know, the fact that you have, in, today in my class, I had, we were seven different nationalities, all of us. And I was talking about, about enculturation, and each person had a different commentary about how to enculturate the gospel in their own culture. It was amazing. I have never had a class like that. So I said to myself, this is the richness of the difference. And that is why I think that sometimes we are like afraid of something that is different. We want people thinking like us, doing like us. But reality is so rich that we cannot have just one vision. It's, the truth is too infinite. So you have like the polyhedra on different angles, different views. And we have to try to combine and try to live and to build peace. And so it, it is interesting, I think, the fact that um, there is a theologian, it says, uh, this is Jean-Marie Tillard, uh, a communical theologian, and he says, both ecumenism and multiculturality underline the diversity within the unity of the church. Both point to the nature of Catholicity. And we have a challenge here. We have the challenge of how to create a church that is open to the different cultures and that does not isolate the communities. Today I was talking with this with my students because they were saying some communities, for example, the Latin Americans, they're all together. I am a Latin American and we have a mass together. And, and I, I try also to not to just go there because it, it, you can become an isolated community. So if I'm in New Zealand, I have to be enriched by the New Zealand culture and have to be enriched also by other cultures. So how do we build this? I think also both of them, ecumenism helps multiculturalism and multiculturalism helps ecumenism. So that's why I think ecumenism is a response for our world, our, our globalized world. I will just... Um, show you just a few elements um, to finish and then begin the dialogue uh, of what the ecumenical perspective of Francis, of Pope Francis. Um, he considered that it is an indispensable path for evangel to evangelization, as I read in the paragraph. But I think I love when he says, is joining together. He created that word in Italian, because in the Italian word doesn't exist, and he created it, because he is always inventing words, because he doesn't speak incredible Italian. So, but what it says, it is an, an encounter. So he proposes an ecumenism of encounter. Ecumenism in which both of us change. So it's not just that I will change you, it's that both of us change in that encounter. And the most important thing is to listen more than to respond. So I think the attitude is that not of arrogance. It's a very humble ecumenism in which I, and I, I think it's fascinating. We were last year, we were in a conference. Lisa, you were also there in an Satfe conference. That was a conference organized um, by an association of theologians, of pastoral theologians, and they were from different churches. So in one activity was okay. He's, um, the, the one who was animating said, okay, now we will have a moment of prayer. So you will choose the one who is near you and you will bless each other. So in the moment, the one who I had beside me was a, a Catholic priest from Australia that I know. So, so all the, the, the couples, no, 
began to, to do the blessing. So the Catholic priest immediately blessed me, no? Oh, Rocio, I bless you and bless all your family. And so I said, okay, Father, I bless you, I bless all your work, your mission, and we finished. And all the others that were from different churches were talking and talking and, and they were just inspired. And we were like looking at them, we move and say, we are Catholics. So it was so funny because we realized that we are like, like we talk, blessing, that's it, we don't need more. And they were, for example, inspired by the world and they were inspired in the moment. And really, I have to say that that encounter helped me so much, you know, um, nurtured so much. So I think that sometimes um, that, that the path for, for ecumenism is humility. What can I learn from you? Um, what can I learn from your experience of faith, of God, of, of yourself, of your life, of your history? And that's what Pope Francis proposes, a ecumenism of dialogue and friendship. It is interesting when, when, when when Pope Francis wrote his first autobiography, when he was a cardinal, he asked Scorca, the, the rabbi of Argentina, to make the prologue, the prologue. And Scorca says, I couldn't believe that he asked a Jewish rabbi to, because he's my friend. And he listens what I say. So he was absolutely touched. And he said, this is ecumenism. It's not big steps. It's a path of dialogue and friendship and journeying together. And of course, we do have to believe that the Spirit will come and the Spirit will, little by little, do that unity. We are already united. Ecumenism has already happened. We are united in Christ. We are the humans that we discuss, we fight. But God has saved us. God has already given this gift of unity. Now we have to work and, and not stopping, working for unity and enriching us. And of course, I think it's interesting to see what's going on that is not moving. Huh? Oh, here it is. Okay, so it says something that I like it, and he says um, in the Patriarchal Church in Istanbul, Pope Francis said, meeting each other, seeing each other face, exchanging the embrace of peace, praying for each other, all essential aspects of our journey toward the restoration of full communion. All of these precedes and always accompany the other ex essential aspects of this journey, the theological dialogue. An authentic dialogue is in every case an encounter between persons with a name, a face, a past, and not merely a meeting of ideas. I think that sometimes we have left the communism just to the theological discussions between theologians about what we believe and what we agree and we are not, do not agree. Yes, our difference, and we do not have to deny the differences. We have to accept the differences. And we don't have to say, oh, we are all the same. We are all the same. We are different. We have different traditions. We have different approaches. We have different dogmas. And there are things that, yeah, that, that are not the same. And we have to respect and try to little by little, comp for example, the last uh, document about the joint declaration of justification, little by little we have realized, oh, we, are, we are not so different regarding justification. There are no things similar than different. Okay, so justification has been one element that we have gone through. But of course there are many others. And little by little this theological dialogue has to continue. Because of course we are not able to discuss with the other if we do not affirm our identity. So we have to be, okay, what is our identity as Catholics? And we know what is our identity as Catholics. But with my identity, I go, and I am open to see, okay, why can I receive? How can I be rich? I will not change my, uh, my, my, my doctrine, my views, but I can, I can change my approach. I can change my, the angles, the nuances, the subtle little topics, and I can really be enriched by the others. So I think that's a big, and that is why uh, 
I think we have to talk about the different types of ecumenism. A daily ecumenism of ecumenism of encounter, I think this is the most important one. And this is the one that we, as common mortals, <laughs> not the theologians, but the, the, the Catholics and, and believers, we have to work daily. Because the beautiful thing here in New Zealand is every day you find people from other faiths, other churches, and other religions. And we can live this daily ecumenism that, uh, that is made of gestures and symbols and attitudes. Second, the ecumenism on service, as I was telling you. Our mission, let's concentrate in why we are here. What, the unity, the visible unity is not an end in itself. The church doesn't exist because of itself. We exist because our mission is to give life to others, is to help others to flourish. So let's unite with the others to do our mission. So I'm really so happy that we have these initiatives with all the, in my case, as a theologian, I say, okay, I will work with other theologians in order, and we, I have now networks with lots of lots of theologians from different confessions and I love it. And I really feel that we are working together in a mission. So what we have to ask is, okay, myself in my situation, how can I work in my mission with other, others, brothers and sisters from other faiths, other communities, other churches? And third, the doctrinal ecumenism. So of course, this has to continue, as he says, that these theological discussions. But there was a, um, there was a congress in, in Georgetown, U, Georgetown University about ecumenism, no? And there were all two cardinals, one Lutheran bishop, two cardinals, and one contemplative nun. So all they were talking about ecumenism. And this contemplative nun said, well, I have to say something at the end, no? She said, she's very, very humble. She said, well, we have to ask, what is the, Pope Francis says, talks about the communism as taking into consideration the hierarchy of truths. Who is the truth? Jesus. Who is Jesus? Mercy. So really, the most important truth is mercy. And mercy can be lived, can be lived and believed for all of us. If we have that truth as the first truth, we are okay. <laughs> I was amazed by that response. I loved it because it's true. And he said some, she said something that also hit me because she said, and the problem is that all the communism has been done in the last centuries by men. And I don't want to criticize men, they are nice, but usually they use more the rational part, the logic part. Sometimes women will use more, a little bit more, the intuitive part. And the intuitive part doesn't go to all the logics of the hierarchy, goes to the result. The result is love, the result is mercy, and then and it's contemplation. In contemplation, we are already in communion with God. It really impressed me. Because it's not that it's not important to talk about what we believe, but actually, what is the main truth? God as communion of love. Exactly, exactly. And finally, of course, the communism in prayer. You no, know, because we believe, and I think that's why I am not a pessimistic. We believe in the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. The unity is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work that we can do by ourselves. Of course, we have to help the Holy Spirit. And um, well, with that, I, I finish. Well so, let's dialogue a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, the floor is open if you have any questions. Yes, commentaries. Yeah, commentaries. Opinions. <laughs> I'd like to make a little comment. I've been involved over the years very much with ministers' associations and things like that. Mm -hmm. I found in practice 
working with the mainstream churches much easier mm. than the Pentecostal one. Mm. And I'll give you one example. When I was in Wanganui, there was a suggestion that we have a combined mission for the area, which I thought, oh, well, let's see what we can do. One of the uh, Pentecostal ministers said, well, the area here is an open field, really, because of ten people, one's a believer, and nine are not. So there's a huge outreach possible. And then they said, of ten people, one's on the way to heaven and nine are on the way to hell. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon, what did you say? And they said, yes, one's on the way to heaven and nine's on the way to hell. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I can't start with that kind of premise when it comes to a missionary outreach. Mm-hmm. And this is reality. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because, but you know, what there, there is something regarding that. I went to a congress and there was a, 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 a guy, uh, I went to a congress in Australia and he was a theologian and he himself as a Pentecostal said, my, my people in my community are so, so fundamentalistic. They are so, so literalist. They take the, the word of God literally. So it is interesting because of course, it is not just your problem. You know, it's a problem also of someone who doesn't, in general, I think it's not, it's fundamentalism that you cannot handle it. When, you know what I mean? Because if, if some denomination is too fundamentalistic, also Catholic denominations are very fundamentalistic and I cannot handle, I can be, I can be able perhaps to dialogue with a, a, an evangelical that will some, Catholics that are not open. So the point is, um, of course, it's true that some denominations are very fundament- very literal, fundamentalistic, and, and it's hard, the dialogue, absolutely. And you cannot, bridge, uh, you cannot build bridges easily because it has to be from the two parts. I don't think it's possible a dialogue when the other part doesn't want to open. And if you have a, a a person who is like that and doesn't accept anything else, there is no dialogue. That's right. And there is no, and that's reality. This is reality. That's reality. No matter what you say. No, you know, no. That's reality. That's reality, and that is why I think you have always to try what is dialogue, encounter, when it is possible. Of course, I will not go to the ones who are not able to do one. What is dialogue? You need two from the two parts. So you cannot dialogue with someone who is not open to that dialogue. So you cannot build ecumenism if the other person has not an ecumenical attitude. But I think that there are many churches that are very open to dialogue. And also within the Pentecostals, I was surprised, for example, these guys that they were telling me, we are trying to change the mainstream of fundamentalism and literalism of the, of the Bible, etc. So, yes, it is a reality, but it is a reality because we are humans. And it is a reality also within the Catholic Church. Sometimes we cannot dialogue with, between ourselves, you know, because there is someone so close in his position that he will never open to another possibility. So, I think it needs conversion. It needs conversion because it, and for, that's why I thought humility. If you are not humble to say, okay, I want to listen, but listen really, there is no possible a dialogue. So what I, for me is I am always trying with those who are open to dialogue. The ones who are not want to dialogue, I will not lose my time. <laughs> but I will not lose my time with a Catholic that doesn't want to dialogue. You know, not just with a, a one of, of, of there we have Catholics that they don't want to dialogue also about one topic. So I think uh, ecumenism is built between people and encounter. Anyone else? Um, I'm with the nun. I'm with the contemporary nun. I think that was a wonderful story. 
and it cuts to the heart of things, and it's not about words. It's yep. too much, we spend too much time on dogma and doctrine. It's about how people relate to each other, it's how people help each other, listen to each other, sympathize and support each other. And that cuts across all divides. Well, because we have been in that way, I like that, that, that none, because we have been in the Western society, okay, we have been very rational regarding our faith. Mm -hmm. Truth, like, oh, truth, truth, no? But who is the truth? It's a person. It's an encounter with a person. So sometimes we are here in ideas, as you say, but it's... It's encounter. Mm. An encounter needs two people mm. able to open, to be open. And I like the uh, I like the idea of listening too. That it's not so much exactly less about talking at each other. It's about listening to each other, really listening to each other. I one one of the things that I've done over the last couple of years is visit as many different churches as I can. I'm a Catholic, by the way, and uh, Visiting as many different churches as I can, just going to the service, asking if I can sit in, sitting in and listening and taking part to the extent that I can. I haven't been to a mosque yet, but I've been to just about every other denomination that you can think of. And I've learned things. I've, I've, I've learned about difference in perspective and emphasis. Um, and people have been interested in why I'm there and <laughs> I think just that's what I'd like to see is the ecumenism of the people. Mm -hmm. It's all very well the theologians and the bishops getting together. Yep. But it's how about um, just a, um, a, uh, an initiative inviting people of all faiths to spend one Sunday a year going to a different church. <laughs> that's a very interesting. To see what happens. It's, yeah. Anyway, that is fascinating. That's as yeah, it's 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 good. Yes. Just picking up on that, that's uh, we talk about this too much of the conversation maybe has been by men, usually <laughs> greyer, white men. Yeah, white. Um, which white I've heard that from other South, South American theologians. <laughs> well, um, probably said the truth there. Um, but um, receptive ecumenism is yep. one of the fruits of recent dialogue yes. and conversations to say, actually, we, we've talked so much that we've dealt with the things where we can agree, common mm. baptism, mm. bits and pieces like that. We might not be there on, in terms of uh, the, the, the seat of Peter and so on, but we can agree on so many things. But yeah. we now we're at the hardwood. Mm. We're at the real nitty-gritty stuff that... This is mm -hmm. going to take a lot more to get through mm -hmm. and a lot more theological mm -hmm. discussion. Yep. Maybe let's just park that yeah. and just get on with listening yeah. to each other rather than trying to tell each other or to reconcile with each other. Each other. Okay. Yeah. And, and if we just sit there and listen, then that's coming into Casper's understanding of harvesting the fruits. Yep. By listening to the other, we might actually learn something yeah. of ourselves after all and if we do that in a way that we're ready to listen rather than tell yeah. then yep. it, it comes back also to Ottoman Sint when, when Pope talks about a, a conversion to unity yeah it's so beautiful mm -hmm. so it's actually a spiritual action then to yeah. have yep. a conversion to a sense of unity mm -hmm. and wanting to work towards unity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then final point, linking back into JDJ, which you mentioned, um, joint declaration of doctrinal justification, mm -hmm. the latest Notre Dame state of saying, well, okay, we've agreed all this, we've done yep. the theological work. Yep. Most of us still don't know what it is yeah. to agree. Nobody has, nobody has read. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. Yeah, exactly. Um, so surely it's more about let's just do stuff together? Yes. Yeah, yes. agree. Amen. Yes, absolutely. Sarah. Yes. Thank you very much. Very challenging. Um, and so, sort of listening along and listening along, um, I found I was almost identifying uh, ecumenism with a, a universal form of anthropology. All, all human beings on earth have a lot in common. And one of the big challenges, well, for me is, is, for example, a secular society 
how, um, for example, a well-run meeting, a well-chaired meeting, where um, those present get the chance to talk and the chair ensures that there isn't somebody dominating or... So that is a form of, of, of where everybody gets a chance to say something in a, in, in quasi a safe, safe environment. Or look, um, some years ago, look at values education or, or bullying. Mm -hmm. For example, we have um, the, 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 it's the secular society that's giving some very good um, feedback on that. And for me, sometimes I wonder if it's, if it's, if it's the best of the secular world that is, that is sometimes nurturing. Yeah. Um, um, it is. Attitudes for me. It doesn't, it's not against what you've said tonight, but it's, um, if I may say, um, I, I need, to, uh, I do give, I, I thank the secular society for sometimes, for often making Christians very accountable. Absolutely. And not only that, I think that also, and we, of course we have not talked about the, the, the other religions and the, the non-believers, but actually, <laughs> sometimes really the non-believers are much better human beings than we are. Than we are. Yes. And I think that that's why I say that, that circles, I do not agree. Who knows who is closer to Jesus? I think perhaps the one who, you know, sometimes I see someone in the street that cannot believe in Jesus and is an incredible person and really loves the others with generosity and, and it's like everything in his person is shouting about God, you know? And, and f that's why I say, who is really close to God? Who are really the ones closer to God? And sometimes not necessarily, as you say, are the believers, not necessarily. And of course we have a gift, but I, 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 I have to say, human beings have much. I have to say, I love to be, I am, I am married with a Kiwi. He's a musician. He's Catholic, but of course, as a musician, all his friends are not. <laughs> and, and I find fascinating the incredible human beings that I encounter and in all this circle of artists, because I am really, I frequently have many meetings with people, with artists, with musicians, with people who live, and they are, and one of them once told me, because I told, I told him that I have been a nun. So he said to me, I am like a monk. I don't have money. <laughs> I live for the music. <laughs> and, I, and, and I really don't care the goods of this world. And I really want people to, to live for the music, to, to see the beauty of music. I was, I really was, surprised by, by what he said and it's true there are people that they have there's so much beauty and, and vocation and, and a spiritual dimension that for me perhaps that's one of the ones who God you know <laughs> wants more and loves more uh, how many of us of Catholics we are so secularized or, or Christians or believers are so secularized and we are so mundane and we have all the ideology, neoliberal ideology of consumerism and materialistic society more than many others human beings. Yes? Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a recent very short statement from the Vatican um, um, about ecumenism and it mentioned that before we start on different ways of being ecumenical, the first thing to do is look to ourselves and um, go through the conversion process ourselves of being open. And um, it strikes me that, um, you know, with about half of our population not um, identifying with the religion, and that isn't to say that they aren't spiritual. Exactly, they don't they, that's true. Um, that um, we have to look at what is it, because a lot of the people are, grew up Christian, <laughs> or their parents did, yeah. or Catholic even. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what we have to do is, is perhaps look at our institution, and we, we are Catholic, but we still have, we're the people of God, but we are also part of an institution. And sometimes it's the people in the institution that aren't loving and merciful and contemplative enough to accept other people. But sometimes it's things in the institution and um, the barriers it puts up that um, keep people from actually wanting to be a part. Exactly. Well, because, yeah, that we are responsible, absolutely, because I think the situation that young people are not coming to our churches, that people are leaving the church, we are responsible for that because we are not giving them the gospel. We, we really have, have to go back to the source. Well, that's why I really love Pope, Pope Francis when he says, a, a poor church for the poor. We are lost in structures and, you know, and strategies and pastoral plans and, <laughs> and you know, our churches are not uh, uh, communities of love and fel fellowship and, and, and we don't journey with the people and we are not with the marginalized and we don't give voice to the marginalized. <laughs> and we, you know, and we do not denounce enough the structures that are injustice. Uh, so we are responsible, I think, that and I don't blame them, some, some of them, that they don't want to be in the church. I really don't blame them. And um, some many people ask me, how do you continue? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I really don't know. Sometimes I really get angry with uh, the institution and, and makes me angry. And, and I struggle, I have to say, I have to be truthful. I, I struggle because I don't feel that we sometimes are really the mirror. But at the same time, I have to recognize I am as limited as the institution and, and all the institutions are the same and we are human and we are here and we have just to continue trying to yeah to be light and not darkness but yeah i agree with you we see we have a question online yeah Rowena, she's a concerned catholic and she asks will we lose our catholic identity to ecumenism is this a danger is there a danger in it well, there is, a, there, is, um, there is no danger when you dialogue, if you know who you are. So, by the contrary, I think that when you dialogue and when you are open to others' ideas, you enrich your own idea. It's not that you will change. It's not, oh, well, you will change, but it's not that you will change your identity. It's that from that identity, I dialogue. So I think it's the contrary, is because I have my, my, my identity, I am open to dialogue. And my, when you are, a, a, I think that when you are a confident person, like a confident, per, for example, I always say that those ones who are always the, the one in positive people in a dialogue, that they want to dominate the conversation, for me, those are the more insecure human beings in this earth because they have to affirm themselves and their truth and what they think. Why do you have to be so assertive? Because you doubt of yourself, because you are not so sure, you are not confident. But when you are sure of who you are, you do not feel the, uh, the risk of changing. You are open and you receive and you can change what you think is good to, for the change and you do not change what you don't want to change. So what I'm thinking is that, by the contrary, when the identity gives you confidence, and the confidence opens you to many situations that, and to many opinions, and if it changes you, it will change you for the best, not for, I am not, I don't feel threatened if someone questions me and, and I said, oh, I have to change my vision. And why not? And we Catholics, we have to change many things. We are not the possessors of the, of, of the truth. The truth is so big, so infinite, that it's better to be challenged, to change something. If someone from another faith says, you have to change that, well, I will be feel like, okay, there is something interesting there. And if it's something that will help me in my identity, of course, I have to discern that what the person is questioning me. But I think that if you are, 
stable and confident of who you are, uh, you don't lose your identity. To the contrary, you enrich your identity. Mm. So, listening through the presentation, it challenges me as a priest mm. because, like the question that you just heard, we are, we, uh, us priests encourage our people to make sure they go to Mass on Sunday, mm -hmm. understand their faith, that the, the children receive the sacraments, those sort of things, those Catholic stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, Listening to the presentation, it seems like that uh, even even as priests in our pastoral area of, of ministry to the people, um, it will be a how can we balance this, the, the the Catholic teachings of the church mm -hmm. and promoting these communities in here? Yeah. Because if we see people they don't come to church, don't receive the sacraments, we kind of worry. Mm -hmm. Are you losing your faith in the, in the sacraments of the church? Are you not the Are you not the Catholic that honors and 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 uh, and, uh, and takes the sacrament seriously? Mm -hmm. You don't come to church on Sunday to receive sacraments. You go to the beach. You go somewhere else. So that's what we teach our people. Mm -hmm. Make sure you hold on to the truth of your church. Mm -hmm. You believe as a Catholic in the sacrament. You believe in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So how can we balance our preaching as a priest with the promotion of the community? I understand because I'm a member of a religious community, mm -hmm. and this is part of our mission to promote ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So ecumenism can be, and uh, I'm not saying a separate thing from our ministry as priests, but priests need to, need yeah. to proclaim what they are told to proclaim. They need to be priests of the Catholic Church and they make sure that people who come to church are nurtured in the sacraments of the church. Yeah, but... And then another yeah, thing that I'm yeah. finish, we, we talk about this, but in our pastoral um, thing in the dances, we sign preference forms. How can we balance this thing welcoming people in and we have to sign this preference form. What is a preference form? For schools. Ah. So if your child is not a Catholic, you're going to be on a waiting list. So how can we open this discussion to the partial area of us priests that when people come in preference form, there are questions there. Are you Catholic? Are you, is your child better than Catholic Church? If you're not, then your child will be on the, the waiting list. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So how can we balance this thing to humanism and Interesting. we have as diamonds? So it, the first question I think what you said is that you're, you are concentrated and, and sometimes we have to be, it's a balance, no? because sometimes we restrict um, the reality of being Christians just to go to mass and to the sacraments. But I think that the way to balance it is understand that of course, you have to do that because that's your mission, but not only because your mission, the sacrament is just a sign of what you have to live all your life. So, for example, you don't have just to say your people to go to mass and receive the Eucharist, but to live a Eucharistic life. A Eucharistic life means to live a, li a life of loving each other accepting differences, and here it comes ecumenism. You know, if you, it has to be, as you say, um, it, not just about our, your teaching as a priest, not just about the ritual and sacramental dimension, but also our mission of to reach and love the human beings and to, to try to build the kingdom of God in this world. And in that way, you, I think that when you push your, or you challenge your people, to build the kingdom of God where they work, where they study in their schools, in the universities, then you have to also challenge them to the fact that they have to embrace all the ones who are different, different races, different cultures, different religions. Every Sunday we do that. <laughs> so you are doing it. So you are doing it. So you are doing it in that way you balance. I, I didn't know about the... Um, I, I didn't know actually. I, I am not in... in 
contact with the education system of the schools here? But that's an interesting question. I don't have Anyone an answer. Anyone comes to my desk, I sign. Go. <laughs> that's a humanism. <laughs> well, well, in a way it is. The two thoughts, I'll come back to the bachelor's in a second. I'm, I'm try, I, I can't remember the name of the document, others might remember it. Is it just only recently that a document came out from the Vatican that basically said part of the life and ministry of a bishop is to be ecumenical. Wow. That is the teaching of the church. And therefore, as I would oh, imagine, as priests and of diocese, course. that's the teaching for the diocese. diocese and, and, I, and I think, look, that you as a priest, you have every week, you know, we live here in a very multicultural society with lots of people are marginalized because they are immigrants, they are different, they are Muslims. And, and the other day, I was talking about the beach. I was in the beach. I love the beach. I was in the beach. It was... Not Sunday, it was Saturday, but I also go on Saturday, but I also go to Mass. But there was a woman, a Muslim woman, absolutely dressed, and also, you know, with a, how do you call it here? Ah? Yeah. And, and, and she just went to the sea just to, to wash her feet. And a group of kids began laughing. Horrible. You know, and insulting her. So I went to talk to her because I said, my goodness, this is horrible. And, and, and she left and I couldn't, I couldn't reach her. But that's your message, you know, that's what you have to teach because what your children, the children that you preach every, every, every Sunday, they are meeting with people from other religions, from other faiths, and you have, you have the responsibility to help them to embrace and love any human being. And I think that's, that's one of your mission. In terms of baptism, so pick up on that, the, yeah. um, we do actually have a common baptism certificate mm. Mm. by all four of the mainstream churches. Oh, that's so interesting. The Roman Catholic, yeah. Methodist, Anglican, Presbyterian have a common baptism certificate that is available through, and it was initiated from the Catholic Diocese of Christchurch. Oh, really? And, and the other denominations were invited to sign into this. So that in that, exactly that situation, it doesn't matter whose baptism it was, the affirmation is that all these baptisms are equal. If you're asked, is this person being baptised? Yes. Well, that's interesting. That can be a proposal. Yeah, that paper there, but they're talking about the preference schools. But yeah. That, that, that school. yeah. Catholic school, but it, it depends what this, that it, it, Anglican schools might be the same, and then it's a matter of it's an ecumenical question itself. Is it, is it matter whether it was a Catholic baptism wow. or an Anglican mm -hmm. baptism or Methodist baptism if they are presenting to mm -hmm. attend the school? Is it the baptism that's key, not the mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a legislative thing, actually. It's a secular state yes. telling us that we must be chosen in fact. So uh, it's one of the results of the integration Act as it was and now um, the Education Act, um, that there was a great concern that Catholic schools would take all the good kids. <laughs> and so they could only teach Catholic kids. So that was actually came from the Ah, uh, probably from the government. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, that's something that you can do. There you, yeah. That's. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I read. I, I, I read. Yeah, I, I read all the, the, the difficulties that because you have been just funded not so many years ago, no? Before they didn't. Ah. Uh? Seventy-five. Seventy-five is nothing. My goodness. It's just. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I, I get it. Yeah. That's interesting. That's, 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 the, that's actually where the problem started. Mm. Yeah. We have another question from online. Uh, Jean Marie Lynette asks, what do you think are the core Oh my goodness, there are too many. <laughs> Poverty, one in New Zealand. Marginalized communities, immigration, refugees. 
I am four now. Victims, victims of violence, women. Victims of violence, this is a problem in New Zealand and it's not, it's not just in the Catholic Church, in the families, the violence, the domestic violence is, we have really to work in families, the violence in domestic violence. It's just, I think we do not understand and what the consequences that it has, is bringing to our societies. All the people that are in jail or, or addicts or they have had violence when they were kids in their, in their homes. So for me, it's, of course, that's a BS because I work <laughs> with victims. So, but for me, it's, it's one concern that I have. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> run away, it falls on me to give you a vote of thanks and for challenging us, for passionately telling your stories. I believe that one of the great things all humans hold in common is that ability to tell a story that we may understand a deeper reality. And from sharing not only your headspace, and let's face it, I do laugh a little bit when theologians talk about, yo, oh, those theologians, um, as if you're a subspecies, but um, not just the academic, the, the drawing on the documents and, and the commentary on the documents and, and that, but also you're telling the stories of how your life has changed through ecumenical movements um, that allow us to glimpse how our lives too may be changed. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Thank you for that. Oh, yummy. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mm. Was good? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeremy Hunt. And Jeremy Thank you for coming. Not at all. I went to the wrong place. I went to the Columbus Centre. No. That's why I'm late. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, it doesn't so matter. Sorry. So good. I turned up for marriage, marriage preparation. I said, this, you're not, this isn't your room. I thought, <laughs> don't make me laugh. Yes, don't you laugh at me. <laughs> you made me laugh. You made me laugh. Thank <laughs> you.